folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard, pastor of Bethel Church in Festus, Missouri, and head of Prophetic Research Ministry with another special edition of the Watchman Video Broadcast. We're going to continue our, our uh, series on the King James Code. We're looking at Bible numerics, Scripture numerics. We're looking at not, not occult numerology, although we will look at some things as we deal with each one of these numbers uh, that apply to the occult side of it. Remember, the devil knows these numbers, and he uses these numbers, and God will give us instruction according to his word from the Bible on what these numbers mean. But we're just going to kind of continue on our study. In the last video, we talked about the num we talked about numbers in particular and how they're important in the scriptures and, and what the Bible says concerning counting things in the Bible. And uh, we dealt with the numbers one and we dealt with the numbers two. Now we're going to deal with the number three in this section. And uh, when someone thinks of the number three in the Bible, automatically they think of the Trinity. There you see the verse on the screen screen there, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now, this verse is one, one of the most important verses in the Bible that actually spells out the doctrine that we call the Trinity. Now, some, some people say now the Trinity is not in, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, and I understand that, but the doctrine clearly is, especially when it comes to this verse, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. Now, the problem with this verse, I I don't have a problem with this verse, but apparently a lot of people do. Apparently this verse is pretty dangerous because the King James Bible is the only Bible in the world, uh, the only English Bible in the world that has this verse in it. Now the New King James puts this verse in it, but it puts sort of a, a mark next to it and they have a little side note down on the bottom of the page that says, uh, the earliest and best manuscripts do not contain 1 John chapter 5 verse 7. None, none of the other English translations translations of the Bible have this verse in it. The NIV, the New English Version, the Holman Standard Bible, uh, the, the Message Bible, all of the new modern translations have omitted this verse uh, out of their text. They say, well, the original manuscripts didn't have that. That's a lie, and they're feeding you a bunch of baloney is what they're doing. This verse is absolutely crucial in that it absolutely spells out the identity of the Father and the, the unity and the identity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And it puts it all there in one verse. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Lots of cults do not believe in the Trinity. The, there is a group of Pentecostals called the United Pentecostals. There may be others. They do not believe in the Trinity. The Jehovah's Witness cult does not believe in the Trinity. And I'm going to tell you, that doctrine is essential. There are, there are sideline doctrines that you and I may disagree on, we may agree on. But when it comes to some of these essential doctrines, they, they must you have to believe the identity of Jesus Christ. He is either fully God uh, or, or the whole thing's off. And so this verse identifies Jesus as being fully God, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and the these three are one. They are separate, yet unified together as God. We're going to look at some other verses that spell this out. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And here again, United Pentecostals, in omitting 1 John 5, 7, and they tell people, oh, the Roman Catholic Church added that, and you don't, you don't have to believe that. Then when you start looking at Matthew 28, 19, when it gives you the formula on how a person is to be baptized, both inwardly and outwardly, they say it doesn't really mean that. We are to baptize in the name of the Father, Father, and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Luke chapter 3 verse 22. Here is another place where you can clearly see the, the separate identities and yet the unity of the Trinity all together. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon Him, meaning Christ, and a voice, that was God the Father, came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in Thee I am well pleased. And so here again we have uh, the, the manifestation of all three forms of what the Bible calls the Godhead. And we'll look at this, we'll look at that word Godhead in a minute. It's neat the way the Bible lays this out. First Peter chapter 1. 
Verse 1, the Bible says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the, here it is now, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Here we are. We, we have in this verse again, we have all three uh, persons of the divine God. Godhead uh, present in the blessing that Peter gave. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18, for through him, meaning Christ, uh, we have we both have access by one spirit, the Holy Spirit, unto the Father, showing not only the unity of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but their office and their relationship one to another. It says that through Christ, we, have, we, we both have access by one Spirit. The Spirit unifies everybody uh, unto God the Father. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So here's another one where we have God the Father, God the Son, and His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, which is also the Spirit of Christ. Second Corinthians. Corinthians chapter 13 verse 14. The Bible says the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. And, and, and we're just looking at verses right now. We're dealing with the number three and we're just looking at verses right now that basically prove the doctrine of the, of the divine Godhead. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, they are equal, they are separate, and yet they are one. Now, some, some people choose that, that since because they can't understand this doctrine, they try to refute the doctrine. They try, since they can't, uh, they can't quite understand it logically with, with, our, with our finite mind, they try to refute the doctrine and say that it doesn't exist. All I'm doing is giving you clear examples from the scriptures that they do exist. They are equal together. They are three, and yet they are one. And let me give you a couple. Let me give you a simple faith guideline here. Even when you don't understand it, believe it. If God's Word says it, then you believe it. And we get understanding when we understand the Godhead. And God, and I'm going to, now I'm going to show you patterns relating to the Godhead. I've shown you scripture verses proving the Godhead. Now I'm going to give you patterns relating to the Godhead. I'm going to show you orders in the Bible, a sequence, a cadence, as it were. Remember, that's the theme when we study numerics and when we study the Bible is that God's Word is written in order. God is not the author of confusion. God's Word is written in order, and therefore we see that order clearly throughout the Scripture. We see patterns and rhythms and cadences. And so the Bible defines the, the nature of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit by calling them the Godhead. And it was interesting to me when I first found this out that that word Godhead is used, guess how many times in the Bible? Three times. Acts chapter 17 verse 29. And notice that in that verse it says, For as much then as we are uh, the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto, look at it, three things, gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. Romans chapter 1 verse 20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And we're going to go back to this verse in a minute. A minute. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now that's describing Christ. Christ had the elements of all three persons of the Godhead in him bodily, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We're going to look at some other verses that relate to that as far as we born-again Christians. Look at Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. Notice the pattern in the sequence here. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, now notice, let's count here, holy, holy, holy. They were speaking to the Godhead, Lord God Almighty, three, which was, past tense, and is, present tense, and is to come, future tense. Time comes in three forms, past, present, and future. And these, these angels, these uh, 
these four beasts, these cherubs that are in heaven, cease not day and night for all of eternity, all eternity to proclaim holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So we have three things that they declare, and they're all broken up in patterns of three. I think God did that. God is delivering to you a cadence and an order so that you could understand and believe the truth of God's word that God is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost all together. And since we are made in God's image, uh, we have that same pattern and that same order inside of us. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are, we since we are made in God's image, and God, in God's image, is fashioned and patterned after the number three. Our, our bodies right now, my body right now is, is composed of three parts. The spirit which God gave me, the soul which is the essence of who I am, and this body for whatever it is which one of these days will be shed off. This is, this is just temporary. I'm going to shed this body one of these days, and I'm going to receive a new body. We'll look at that uh, uh, later on down the road in this study on the number three, because it has to do with the number uh, of resurrection as well. And since I'm referencing my body, the, remember that Paul said your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. When we look into the wilderness tabernacle, or we look into the temple that God told Moses to build, that Solomon built there in Jerusalem, we see the evidence of the triune Godhead inside of the tabernacle. Notice you have in the most holy place, you have the Ark of the Covenant, which represents God the Father. That's his mercy seat. That's his throne where he sits. On the north side, in the sanctuary part, you have the table of showbread, which is Christ. Christ said, I am, the, I am the manna, or I am the bread that comes down from heaven. The bread of life is Jesus Christ. And then on, over on the south side, you have the candlestick, which represents the Holy Spirit. And on this candlestick, there were seven candles on there. And John said that he saw the seven candlesticks, and he said they represent the seven spirits of God. If you want to look at those seven spirits, uh, read Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 11, they're there. All of these exist in, in heaven. Now, there are the Bible lays out that there are three heavens. I think the Muslims believe in seven of them, but in, in, they're wrong, by the way. Anyway, the Bible teaches that there are three heavens. Number one, there is the realm of the atmosphere of planet Earth, where the clouds exist. That is the first heaven. The second heaven would be the realm of the stars or the universe that exists. That's the second heaven. The third heaven, notice what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. He said, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such an one caught up to the third heaven. And up there, he saw things that he could not utter. The third heaven is where, and I like this, the third heaven is where God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit um, exists right now. Jesus is there at the right hand of the Father. Their spirit is there. And uh, even though the spirit is poured out on the earth, God can be all places at one time. It, that he's not bound just because he's in heaven. Doesn't mean he can't be in earth at the same time. That's the, the greatness about God. And so we have these patterns of the, the, the tabernacle, the, the, the spirit, soul, the body, the things that are in the tabernacle. And we have the third of heaven. Incidentally, um, we know that the earth is the third planet in relation to the sun. We have uh, Mercury, Venus, and then earth. It's the third planet in our solar system where God the Father literally is New Jerusalem is going to come down from heaven. It's going to bridge the gap between heaven and earth and it all matches. Now let's go back to Romans chapter 1 verse 20 because there's something I want to show you here. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Now I talk about this on several videos but I want to deal specifically with what's being said here when it, when it talks about the Godhead. It says that the Godhead can be seen in the creation. And what when we, when we talk about the creation let's go back to the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. 
And it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at this number three, and we're going to look at patterns that are associated with the creation and things that you and I ought to be able to see. Number one, we have, and you see there, we have the elements of time, space, and matter. Let me explain that. Uh, we, have, we have time mentioned in here, in the beginning, God. And so, there was a beginning of time. And as we looked at a while ago, time exists in three forms as far as our understanding. Our understanding. Past, present, and future. The elements of three inside of time. In the beginning, that's time, God created the heaven. That is space. Okay? Before God can create matter, which is everything that exists is composed of matter. Before God can create matter, He has to have space to put it in. It's kind of like when you buy new furniture, okay? When you buy new furniture, you have to have some place to put the new furniture. You have to have space to put it in. And so God created the expanse of the universe. That's the heaven that he was referring to, the second heaven. God cre In the beginning, God created space. He created the heaven. And space, as far as our understanding, comes in three forms, length, width, and depth. That's called three dimensions. Three, you've heard of 3D, 3D movies, three-dimensional space. That's what that's referring to. So we have the elements of time, past, present, future, the element of, of space, which is the heavens, which is length, width, and depth, and then we have the earth, which represents matter. And if you remember from your physics class or, your, or from your elementary school, you remember that matter shows up in our universe in three forms. Solid, liquid, and gas. Three, three things that are composed of three different ways of looking at them or three different ways of appearing. That is the brilliance of God. That shows His pattern. That shows His signature, His design in the universe. It didn't just blow up into a big bang. God created it to look and to be fashioned like him. You see, an artist will create a work of art that reflects their personality, their, their soul, as it were. And when God created this universe, it reflects God's personality, His nature, His character, His order. Everything about God is found. And so when we see that, we are without excuse because we can understand the Godhead. Speaking of the Godhead, God was so particular about this that he put it into the law. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. The Bible says, Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose. In the feast of unleavened bread, in the feast of weeks, and in the feast of tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Now, here's what this is saying. Three times a year, every male who was a Jew had to go to Jerusalem for a feast. The first First thing was the Feast of Passover. The second one was the feast, feast of Weeks, which was Pentecost. The third one was the Feast of Tabernacles. Now get this, this is neat, because the Feast of Passover relates specifically to the Passover Lamb, which was Jesus Christ. The Feast of Weeks, which was Pentecost, points you directly to, guess who? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The fulfillment of Passover took place at Passover. That's neat. The fulfillment of the Feast of Weeks, which was the end gathering, the harvest, took place. Uh, the fulfillment was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That took place literally on the Feast of Weeks or the day of Pentecost. We have one holiday, Jewish holiday, Jewish feast day that is left unfulfilled yet. It's the Feast of Tabernacles. I think, I think, that somehow, some way, and, and the Feast of Tabernacles is God Himself is going to dwell with mankind. That's what the Feast of Tabernacles points you to. God Himself. We see that in the book of Revelation when God creates a new heaven and a new earth and new Jerusalem comes down. That is God Himself is going to dwell with His people, the, the new creation as it were. I think somehow, some way, God is going to fulfill that holy day or that feast day 
on that day, three times a year. Now take a look at this. Jesus, when he, uh, he, he was told about, you remember the story about Lazarus. Jesus was told about Lazarus, his friend, that he was sick. And remember, d Jesus delayed his, his going to see Lazarus, and he did it for a reason. He wanted people to know that he just, he, 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 he not only could just heal, but he could actually raise people from the dead. That's why he waited Listen, my friend, just because a Christian dies, that's not the end of the story. God has resurrection power. And so Jesus goes to the tomb of Lazarus, and he's already been dead four days, and we'll look at that when we look at the number four. But Lazarus has already been dead now for four days. And Jesus stood in front of the tomb of Lazarus, and he begins to pray. And when he finished praying, look at what he said. Three words. Lazarus come forth. And the Bible says that he that was dead came forth. You see, because not only is the number three associated with the Godhead, but the number three is associated with resurrection, life from death. We as Christians are to be the happiest people in the world because we're the ones, we're the only ones in the world who get to look at a casket of a, of a fallen saint and say, God's not done yet. His best work is yet to come. Death is not the end to someone who believes the Word of God. Lazarus, come forth. And I want you to, and, and I want something I want to throw in here too. Dead people cannot raise themselves. You who are dead in trespasses and sins cannot raise yourself back to life. No amount of preaching, no amount of, of anything else that you do religiously can raise you from the dead. You, only the power of the Word of God in your life. This, this Bible is not the book of the dead. It is the book of of the living. Its words are life. God breathes life into us when we read the scriptures and when we hear them preached uh, according to the word of God. God breathes new life. You want revival in your life? Get your Bible out and let God speak revival into you. This revi There is a revival coming, by the way. It is coming to Israel. I believe in the resurrection of dead Israel. Notice this, Hosea chapter 6 verse 2. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Now I want you to, I want you to get this. We're going to look at something here in just a minute that explains more about what I'm talking about. But I want you to notice a pattern of, of, what's, of what I call the third day pattern. We see it. You see the phrase third day all throughout the scriptures. On the third day this, on the third day this. A after two days this happened. After two days and then on the third day this happened. You see it all through the scriptures and there is a proclamation here in Hosea, Hosea chapter 6 verse 2 that after two days expire God is going to raise dead Israel back to life again. Now we know that Jesus was resurrected from the dead after being laid in the tomb for two days. On the third day Jesus rose back from the dead and so he fulfills the scriptural pattern. But there is yet more to this that we're going to see from the scriptures. Notice in Exodus chapter 19, verse 11, God tells them, now this is when, this is when Israel now is gathered around Mount Sinai, and God is about ready. Get this language. I love this. Oh, I love the King James. Read the Bible. God says, I'm going to come down in your sight. Oh, think about, think about God coming down to us. Number one, personified in Jesus Christ coming down from heaven. Number two, personified in God himself coming down from heaven, dwelling with his people inside of New Jerusalem. And so he says, and be ready against, watch this, the third day. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. I love this because the third day 
is a time prophecy. Understand time prophecies. And there is more than one time prophecy than just seven years. Okay? There's more than that. There are time prophecies all throughout the scripture. And the third day prophecy is one of them. So God says on the third day, he's going to, and he says, be ready. Because on the third day, I'm going to come down in the sight of all the people. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, and every eye shall see him. I believe that God is going to make a third day appearing in this world. And what, am I, what are you talking about, Pastor Mike? Well, remember, in Psalm, Psalm 90, verse 4, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, Peter said that, Know ye not that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now, a lot of, a lot of amillennial scholars, a lot of people who choose not to believe the literalness of the scriptures say, well, you know, that doesn't really mean anything. Oh, yes, it does. Oh, yes, it does. And I'm going to show you throughout the whole sequence of these videos that I do on the King James Code that when the Bible gives a number, it means exactly what it says. If Jesus says that I'm going to rise again on the third day, does he rise again metaphorically on some other day than the third day? No. When God, when the, the prophet told Naaman to dip in the river Jordan seven times, how many times does he dip in the river Jordan? Seven times. Take the numbers literally. They have a symbolic meaning, and that's what we're showing you in these videos. But they are also to be counted as literal as you and I count numbers right now. If I, if I told you that I was going to give you a check for $100, and you went, wow, that's great, and I wrote you a check for 10 bucks, and said, well, you know, that's a lot to me. It doesn't mean the same, does it? God said that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as as one day. So watch this. From the time of Christ until roughly about the time of right now, and I don't know exactly when it is, but 2,000 years have expired. Two days. Be ready because Christ is about ready to return to the earth on the third day. And how long is a day? It's a thousand years. And how long is Christ going to rule and reign over planet earth? One thousand years. That third day is also the seventh day from the creation. And we'll talk more about that as we progress in our study of numbers. But the millennial reign of Christ, a thousand years, literally is the, the third day and the seventh day that you see in the scriptures. They all apply uh, the same way. John chapter 2 verse 1, And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Well, I'll tell you what, we're, we're getting ready for the third day marriage uh, that Jesus is going to show up at. John chapter 2 verse 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise Raise it up, but he spake of the temple of his body. See, the number three is a number for resurrection. Now, this phrase, uh, th this concept of resurrection has everything to do with what the Bible calls being born again. I'm going to ask you a question. Are you born again? Don't just say that you believe in God. Don't just say that you believe in Jesus. And don't just say that you read the Bible every now and then. I'm asking you, are you prepared for heaven? Are you born again? You see, being born again implies that we have died to the old self and that we are literally born again into the kingdom of God. Since this phrase has to do with resurrection, we look in our King James Bibles three times in there. John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John chapter 3, verse 7, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. First Peter chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, which is from our earthly parents, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Remember, you cannot save yourself, and dead people cannot rise from the dead on their own. It takes the incorruptible Word of God. The phrase born again mentioned three times in the Bible. Here's another one. Luke chapter 20, verse 35. The phrase resurrection from the dead being found three times in the scripture. Exactly three times in the scripture. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 uses the phrase living God. That has to do with resurrection, life, being given life again. Living God. This phrase is mentioned exactly 30 times in the King James Bible. Now, remember, this video is about the King James Code. There are sequences and patterns and rhythms 
items that God speaks in in the Bible, and they are clearly identifiable. I'm not pulling something out of thin air and saying, well, this means that. I'm, I'm sticking to the Scriptures. And you look at this phrase, living God, no wonder that it's found exactly 30 times in the King James Bible. By the way, you can search these patterns out in other translations. You won't find them. You won't find them there. That is the premise of this. Look at Mark chapter 12, verse 26. Jesus, Jesus was talking about it and he said, And as touching the dead, they that rise, have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You therefore do greatly error. In other words, you're in error if you don't believe two things. Number one, notice the pattern. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. Father, Word, Holy Ghost. You're in error if you don't believe that. Number two, God is not the God of, of the dead. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are not dead. Their bodies died, but they're not dead. They are alive right now. In fact, they're more alive than you and I are right now. God is not the... Notice the pattern of three. God is not the God of the dead but the God of the living. And he spake this to the Sadducees because the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection. And he's in the direct context of teaching of the resurrection of souls from the dead. And he says, God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Notice this verse, the phrase, His mighty power mentioned three times. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward who believe according to the working of His mighty power? which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. This all has to do with resurrection, and we're seeing patterns of three in the Scripture. Now we go to the third day of creation, the third day of creation. What was created on day three of creation? Notice what the Scripture says. Genesis chapter 1, verses 11 through 13. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, or herb, the way some people say it, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And in, in verse 13, in the evening and the morning were the third day. Now I want you to notice that on the third day, God created seeds. Take a look at a seed. A seed has three parts. Spirit, soul, and body. The embryo, the cotyledon, and the seed coat. The seed coat is that hard outer shell. It's the chaff as it were. The chaff that has to be blown away of the wind. That The chaff is burnt up with fire, the Bible says. John the Baptist preached concerning Jesus. He said, whose fan is in his hand. And he's going to thoroughly purge the floor of his garner, which basically means that Christ came to do away with the seed coat, which is our flesh. It's going to rot. And by the way, in fact, I'm getting ahead of myself here. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is why when somebody dies, we plant them. Okay? Look at 1 Corinthians. By the way, three parts to a seed God created on the third day. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 35. I'm getting happy. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is, uh, is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. Thank God I'm not going to look like this in my new body. I don't know what it will be. I can't perceive it. But I know that when I die... They're going to have to plant me in the ground so that I can raise up a new body just like the seed. I believe in resurrection. That's why, listen to me, that's why when we baptize, we baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Three. Why? Because we believe that they'll rise again. 
not just like the Jesus name only people who only baptize in Jesus name and don't give me all this stuff about how you read it in the book of Acts I'm following the commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ when I baptize people in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Ghost because I believe three I believe they're going to be raised back to the dead or raised back from the dead one of these days now notice Genesis chapter 6. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And I want to, I want to show you another pattern that I found in the Scriptures. This is, this is one of those that's on my neat list. I like this one. Noah had three sons. And later on, we're going to look at those three sons in, in a different light concerning the number three. But I want you to notice that Noah had three sons. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 22, we all know what happened. We know that one of those three sons went in and saw his father's nakedness. He committed a crime. He committed a sin, and and notice it says, and Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. Now his two brethren, uh, Shem and Japheth, walked in backwards uh, with a blanket, and they covered up Noah. They did not want to send the sin of Ham. Now in Genesis chapter nine, we know that Ham and his seed is cursed. Okay, or Canaan is cursed because of what Ham did. Now I want you to notice this. This sets a pattern for us because if we have three things that we can see in the scripture, we're going to see that one of them is cursed. We're going to see that one of them is cursed and two of them are not. Or, And I'm going to illustrate a little bit better. One of them goes down and the other two rise up. Look back at the seed again. When we plant a seed in the ground, and I'm planting a garden this spring, and I just yesterday I was planting seeds in the ground. I was thinking about this. That seed coat dies and corrupts in the ground. It doesn't go anywhere. In fact, it is of no use once it's dead. It is of no use whatsoever. Once you plant that seed in the ground, the seed coat has then done its job. It's protecting the, the, the what's inside of it. But anyway, once you plant it in the ground, the seed coat dies. It's the other two that work together, the cotyledon and the embryo, that rise up into a new body. Now I want you to think about that. Look at verse First uh, Thessalonians chapter five, verse twenty-three. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So think about this. When when you are when you're lost when you're excuse me when your saved loved one is planted in the ground, uh, the body stays there. It doesn't go anywhere. The spirit and the soul rise up. And I'll say this, even a lost loved one, this is going to happen to them because the Bible says that there is a resurrection of the damned. Everybody who has died on this earth, their body is going to, they're going to be resurrected in a new form. They're going to stand before the judgment of Almighty God. And if they died in their sins, they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. That's what the scripture says. So are we, we have patterns now that of three, one goes down and two goes up. Look at this picture. It's the cross. In fact, it's how many crosses? Three crosses. And we have two thieves on either side of Jesus and one of them curses Jesus. If you be the son of God, why don't you cast yourself? But the other one on his other side said, Lord, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? This day shalt thou be with me in paradise. What happened here? Out of three crosses, one guy stays down the other two go up. I like that. One third. One third is cursed. Take a look at this. Revelation chapter 8 verse 7. The first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth. Watch this. And the third part of the trees was burnt up. Look at verse 8. The third part of the sea became blood. Verse 9. The third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. That means two thirds were saved. One third was cursed. Revelation chapter 8, verse 10, the third part of the rivers. Verse 11, the third part of the waters became wormwood. Verse 12, the third part of the sun was smitten. Third part of the moon and the third part of the stars. Now remember this, the third part of the stars. Because when we look at Revelation chapter 12, when we're going to get there in a minute, we're going to see that. Uh, we're going to see that in picture form. Revelation chapter 9, verse 18. By these three was the third part of men killed by fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. Now look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. Because even though we have an innumerable company of angels, we see that one third of the angels were what? They were cast down to the earth. They're cursed. 
while the two-thirds remain. These patterns, you see them all through the scripture. Now look at this. I like this. The third day is a principle that points you to resurrection and new life. In Genesis chapter 22. Remember, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. Genesis chapter 22 verse 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. What was Abraham looking at? He was looking at Mount Moriah, where Calvary is, where the place of the cross, or the, excuse me, the place of the skull is. That's where he was looking at. And he saw it afar off. The phrase afar off in the Bible is like a, it's like a future term. When, when, when you read the Bible, Peter says, when you read the Bible and understand it, you can see afar off, which means that we can see into the future by using the Bible, by using the Scriptures. Abraham, by faith, looks at the place afar off. I just love the language of the King James Bible. These other Bibles trash it so bad. Abraham looks on the third day and he sees the place afar off. If you count... The number of years between Abraham and Jesus Christ, it's 2,000 years. Two days expired, and on the third day, Abraham sees Jesus afar off. He sees, the, and, his, and what is Abraham doing in Genesis 22? He's taking his only son to offer him up as a sacrifice. And on the, since we're dealing with the number three, what did Abraham believe concerning this? He believed that even if he had to kill Isaac, God was able to raise him from the dead. Look at this. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Offered him. Offered him. Keep that in mind. Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called... Accounting that God, seed, there it is, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. The word figure is a word that refers to typology. The typology of Abraham taking his son to Mount Moriah to offer him up there, believing that God would raise him from the dead. All of these elements are Jesus Christ. Remember, this, the, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Every prophecy in the Bible always revolves around the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, let's look at another aspect of the number three. Let's go back to Genesis, go to the third chapter of the Bible. God has shown me that number meanings can be found in the Genesis chapter because God always lays everything out in order. Genesis chapter three, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and pleasant to the eyes and desired to make one wise. I want you to notice something here is that she desired it to make one wise and that she saw this now the number three um, has a, has a has like a secondary theme to it and that is a theme of wisdom or being able to see things and this and remember when she ate of this fruit the devil promised her that her eyes would be open. So let's look at that. There are two aspects of this that we'll look at. Number one is the aspect of in, in God's realm or de God's definition of it. And the other one is the, is the realm of, of Satan and his definition and his use of it. So let's look at this number three or the number 33 or the number 333, whatever, the repeating threes. Let's look at this in the context of wisdom. Notice the verse, Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Ezekiel 33, 33, And when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come. Then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. Job 33, 3, My words shall be of the uprightness of my heart, and my lips shall utter knowledge clearly. Job 33, 33, If not, hearken unto me, hold thy peace, and I shall teach thee wisdom. Notice that in Numbers 33, 3, we have the word sight. And it was interesting to me that the word sight is used exactly 333 times in the King James Bible. So I went to the 333rd chapter of the Bible. That's Isaiah chapter 38, verse 3. And we have the word sight in the 333rd chapter of the Bible in the third verse. And this is a reference to Hezekiah, who's mentioned 33 times in the Bible. Hezekiah is a type of Christ. In the 333rd verse of the Bible, guess what I found? No, I didn't find the word sight, but notice the verse. And the Lord said unto Abraham, after that lot was separated from him, lift up thine eyes and look. 
And he tells him to look northward, southward, eastward, and westward. Now that's the number four. And that's gonna, we're going to talk about that uh, in the next segment when we deal with the number four. In the book of wisdom, the book of Proverbs itself, the word wise is mentioned 66 times. That's 33 times too. How many books are there in the Bible? 66. All forms of the word know mentioned 66 times in the Bible. This is the King James, by the way. All forms of the word understand mentioned 66 times. Now I want you to notice this. Genesis chapter 49, there is a name given called Shiloh. The prophecy is, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Shiloh is not only a, not only, watch this, it's not only the first capital of Israel. It's where, when they went into the promised land, that is where they set up their first capital. That's where they set up the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant. But it is also a name for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now remember, Jesus was 33. And who does all wisdom come from? It comes from Jesus. There's another aspect of his age that we'll look at a little bit later on. But Jesus is 33 years old. And notice that Shiloh is mentioned exactly 33 times in the King James Bible. I love it. I believe God's Word is in order. I believe there are patterns in it. Don't tell me they're not because I know a bunch of them and I believe there are. Notice that in the typology of David the king, remember David is the king of the Jews. And I want you to notice this. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 30 and three years over all Israel and Judah. Now get this because this is neat. This to me lays out a formula. Because remember, Jesus was 33 years old. He was proclaimed king of the Jews uh, when he was born. Remember, Herod said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? He was proclaimed king of the Jews at his death. Remember, Pontius Pilate said the exact same thing. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. So he is king of the Jews in one place for 33 and a half years. What is, according to the typology of David, reigning seven years one time, 33, or seven and a half years, and 33 years in another, what does that leave us? That leaves us a period of, guess how long? Seven years that I believe that Jesus is going to restore himself as being the king of of the Jews. We see that same pattern in the law concerning the purification of a woman who's had a man child. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman have conceived seed and born a man child, then she shall be unclean seven days. According to the days of the separation for infirmity, shall she be unclean. And she shall then continue in the blood of her purifying three and thirty days. She shall, not, she shall touch no hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying be fulfilled. Isn't that amazing? That even And this is what Mary had to go through when she gave birth to Jesus. She was in the day of her purification. And the Bible is referencing that for you so you can go back and look and get wisdom and get understanding. Now let's go back to Shiloh and see its reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Joshua 18 verse 1 says that Shiloh is where the tabernacle was set up. That is the first capital of Israel. Now Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 12 we see that God says to them, But go ye now unto my place which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. Now get this. Remember, Shiloh was a picture of the, G of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I like this. Shiloh represents Christ in that that is, and that is where the first capital of Israel was. Now remember, there are two capitals. Shiloh, Jerusalem. Anytime, well, from our study of the number two, anytime you see the number two, you always reference first coming, second coming of Jesus Christ. First and second. The first coming of Christ is characterized in Shiloh in that number one, Shiloh um, was mentioned 33 times in the King James Bible. And that's the exact age upon which Christ died. But Christ also was destroyed just like Shiloh, just like it was. His body being destroyed in, in the death of the cross. And, and I, I hope you understand that. So Shiloh represents the first tabernacle. Jerusalem represents the second tabernacle. And here's the interesting thing. Shiloh is mentioned 33 times in the King James Bible. Jerusalem is mentioned 667 times in the Old Testament of the King James Bible. That makes 700 
Now that's not a reference to Pat Robertson and his 700 club. The number 700, and we'll look at this when we look at the number 10 and the number 7, the number 700 points you to the millennial reign or the kingdom of God. 7 is the number for God and his perfection, and the number 100 is, is, is associated with 10, 100, and 1,000. They all have to do with dominion. We're talking about the kingdom of God here. See, I believe that every word in this Bible is perfect. Notice that since we're dealing with the number 3 or the number 33 in wisdom, notice in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, there were wise men who were seeking where Jesus was. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? The wise men were seeking him. And remember, Herod brought out the scribes and the scholars, and he said, find out where Jesus was to be born. Find out where this guy was to be born. And where did they find it out at? They found it in Micah which is the 33rd book of the Bible. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Isn't that amazing? God's patterns, God's order in the Scripture, it's all there, folks, for our learning, for our understanding, and for our wisdom. Now let's look at this last aspect or this last understanding of the number three, or at least as far as I understand, uh, concerning the number three. Let's go to the third chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter three, look in verse six. And when the woman saw that the tree was, let's do counting here, number one, good for food. Number two, that it was pleasant to the eyes. Number three, a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Now remember, fruit was created on day three of creation. So the patterns are all there in the scriptures. God does everything in order. He never does anything out of order. That's why he tells us in our churches, let all things be done decently and in order. So when you go into a church and they're doing everything pell-mell and everything's wild and crazy and they're getting delirious and that is not God. It's not Him. Okay? So anyway, God has everything in order. But I want you to notice that she ate fruit created on the third day and she noticed three things about this fruit. It's good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and desired to make one wise. Now remember, God always follows patterns. So when we look in the New Testament, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, remember it was good for food, the lust of the eyes, it was pleasant to the eyes, and the pride of life, it was desired to make one wise. He says, is not of the Father, but is of this world. So sin comes in three categories. All sins that are in the world fall into one or even multiple of these categories. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And I'll ask you, who's not guilty of, of these three things? Well, we know Jesus was not guilty of any of these. But you and I are. We are desperately, hopelessly full of sin and corruption in the third part of us, which is our bodies, our flesh. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Even when we look at Jesus, being tempted in the wilderness. He was tempted three times exactly these three ways. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. When we look at James chapter 1, verse 15, we see that sin has three stages to it. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now, I want you to notice, I want you to, I want you to get this in your mind. Notice that we have birthing terms or, or life terms. We have conception, we have bringing forth, and we have death. All of these, number one, speak about our flesh. David said, I was shapen in iniquity, okay? And by, in lust he was conceived and he was shapen in iniquity. Notice that James said, lust when it hath conceived. Sin starts out as a conception in your mind. It starts out here, okay? And then it brings forth sin. That's the birth. And then when it is finished, it bringeth forth Death. That's the end of everything. We're going to look at this verse a little bit later on in a, a very, very neat thing that I see in the Scripture. But this also applies, I believe, as one of those verses that I think is teaching us about the advent of the Antichrist, the birth of the man of sin himself, 
the son of perdition. Adam was the first man to sin. And I want you to notice that we go, we're going to go back to the book of Genesis. We're going to look at, we're going to follow the trail of sin. You see, because I believe that I'm a sinner and I believe that you're a sinner because you are a child of Adam. We survived, our grandparents survived the flood and we are children of Adam. We're going to follow the pattern that God gives us. Number one, Adam is mentioned exactly 30 times in the King James Bible. How old was Jesus when uh, he, he started his ministry, 30 years old? Adam was mentioned 30 times in the King James Bible. And I want you to notice that Adam, in Genesis chapter 4, he gives birth to a son by the name of Seth. Now, Seth is not the first son of Adam. Seth, we have Cain, who was born first. We have Abel. Cain's lineage did not survive the flood. Abel was killed by his brother. And so we are all the descendants of of Seth. Every human being on the earth is a descendant of Seth. Seth is the third son of Adam. Then notice Genesis chapter 5 verse 32, and Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Three sons, the three progenitors of, of the human race. Um, those who study, um, uh, I forgot what it's called, those who study mankind, anthropologists, recognize that there are three primary races of men on the earth. There is Caucasoid, Negroid, and Mongoloid. All of humanity is a combination of one, two, or even all three of those primary races. So we see that Shem, Ham, and Japheth were the progenitors of mankind. So, so far, sin has followed a track. Adam, mentioned 30 times, Seth, who is the third-born son of Adam. Now we have the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, of whom anybody in this world can trace their lineage back to any of those three. Because the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We see, when we go back to Genesis chapter 22 again, remember, Abraham is taking his son Isaac to Mount Moriah. It's a picture of the cross. When did he see Mount Moriah? He saw it when? On the third day. And remember, 2,000 years expired from Abraham to Jesus, and now Jesus comes and he's the sacrifice for sin. Notice that when we, we, have, we have Abraham, we have Isaac, we have Jacob, and all three of them were sinners. Go look at the Bible. All three of them were sinners. And Jacob has his sons, which are the 12 tribes of Israel. What was the third son of Jacob? It was Levi. Notice the verse. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi. Now I want you to think about this. Because what did the tribe of Levi go on to do? What is the third book of the Bible? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. And Leviticus deals specifically with the tribe of Levi, that's who it's named after, and the law concerning the sacrifice for sin. That's what the third book of the Bible deals with, the sacrifice and the price for the sins of mankind, which come in three forms. Uh, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. God always follows a pattern here. Now let's move forward to Jesus. Tempted three times in the wilderness. He appears after 39 books of the Bible, which is three times 13. That's a number we'll study later on. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So everything about Jesus is going to have to do with sin in some way. Now Jesus did not sin one time but upon him was laid the sins of the entire world notice that he was tempted three times crucified at age 33 sold for 30 pieces of silver crucified at the third hour endured three hours of darkness hung between two thieves 
which we already saw there was three crosses. Why were there three crosses? Because Isaiah prophesied of him in Isaiah chapter 53 by saying he was numbered with the transgressors. One, two, three. And notice this. I like this. This is on my neat list. John chapter 19 verse 30 records for us the three final words of Jesus when he's on the cross. He says, it is finished. Now, I had always heard in, uh, in my childhood growing up in church by, by, good, by good preachers, I'm not knocking them, but I had always heard that, you know, according to Jewish tradition, there's your thing right there. According to Jewish tradition, when the high priest would perform his yearly duty on the Day of Atonement, he would walk out of the tabernacle, walk out of the sanctuary, and he would present himself to the people and he would say, it is done. Okay. I went looking for that in the Bible. I didn't find it anywhere. I mean, I looked, I looked, I looked. I didn't, I didn't see that anywhere. If the Jews did that, that's fine. But I don't see anywhere where God commanded it. And so I wondered, I prayed, God, why did Jesus say those three words? It is finished. What was he talking about? So I just looked up the phrase, it is finished. It's only found two places in the whole King James Bible. I love the King James Bible. It's only found two places. Remember Jesus, and, and it says, when Jesus therefore received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost, which means he died. The only other place in the whole Bible where these three words are found in a phrase, it is finished. James chapter 1, verse 15. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. I love that. Jesus was our sin hanging on the cross. He died to take away my sin, to take away your sin, to take away the sins of the entire world. And I'm telling you that everything that God does is in a discernible, knowable pattern. All these people that are going around telling you, oh, God's doing a new thing. And I've even been told that by some people that, well, not everything that God does is in the Bible. That is a lie. That is a lie. Number one, you'll never be able to find the verse in here that says that God does things outside of the Bible. Never be able to find it. In fact, the book of Amos says, Surely the Lord will do nothing, but He revealeth His secret to His servants, the prophets. Now, those prophets are not John Arnott of the, of the uh, Toronto blessing cult that's up there. It's not the guy down in Pensacola. It's not Rodney Howard Brown. It's not Kenneth Copeland. It's not the Kansas City prophets. It's Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, John the Baptist, Enoch, Moses, Jesus, the Apostle Paul. Those are the prophets spoken of in the Scriptures. So if anybody tells you God does something outside of the Bible, they're lying to you. Now I want to look at some typology here. Notice Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 10. And now behold the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. Now let's stop right here. We have three names mentioned. Remember, God uses typology to show us things. He uses patterns to show us what these, chapter, what these things mean. These, the Bible says all these things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. They're written for our admonition. They're written for our understanding so that we would understand. And so when I see three things in the Bible, I'm either looking at the Godhead or I'm looking at spirit, soul, and, and, and body, or I'm looking at sin in one fashion or another. I'm looking at the man of sin is what I'm looking at. And here we have the children of Ammon, the children of Moab, and the children of Mount Seir, we have three. I want you to get this story. In fact, I'm not going to read the whole thing, Second Chronicles chapter 20. Go read this. a beautiful story. Because here we have Judah, Jerusalem, uh, Jehoshaphat the king. And we have three armies that are going to come down and invade. And I want you to get this. Because these three armies are, are like the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And you know what Jehoshaphat realized? You know what he figured out? He figured out that he couldn't win. He couldn't win. 
Jehoshaphat realized that he was not going to win this battle. That those three armies were going to kill him. You are very wise if you will come to the place in your life where you will realize that the lust, your lust of the flesh, your lust of the eyes, and your pride of life is going to kill you. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Death is going to kill you one of these days. We have death living in our bodies right now. So Jehoshaphat realized that these three armies were going to kill him. It was going to kill him, his family, and everybody in Jerusalem. There was an attack. Listen, there is an invasion of sin in this world right now. And it's going to kill people. It's real. Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat realized that his only hope was God. And I want to tell you something. You say you believe in God. You say you believe in Jesus. You say you believe the Bible. You believe in this and that and the other. But I want to tell you something. The Bible is not a self-help manual to help you get yourself out of sin. That's not what it is. You cannot change your thoughts enough. You cannot change your attitude. You cannot change your habits. You cannot change... Listen, you cannot change who you are. Only God can. And so Jehoshaphat real and the quicker you realize that you're on your way to hell, the better off you're going to be. Because then when you realize that you can't do anything about it, you know this they, the people say this phrase, well, God helps those who help themselves. No, he doesn't. God helps people who realize that they can't help themselves. And Jehoshaphat realized that he could not help himself. And so he implored, he implored God, and he said, God, these, these guys are going to kill us. God, will you help us? And I want you to notice, because God sent word to a prophet. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15. And he said, Hearken ye all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Do you get it? The battle against the three, it's not your battle because you can't win. The battle against the three is God's. Three crosses, three words, it is finished. Three days later, the victory is complete because Jesus rose from the dead. Isn't that a beautiful story? Here's another one. I, I just found this one the other day. Here's another one. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 5. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee. There's three again. Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah. There's three. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. And they've taken evil counsel against thee. There is a conspiracy to destroy you. There's a conspiracy to destroy your family, your marriage. There's a conspiracy. Sin, sin is destroying our country. It's, that's why we cannot win in the circle of politics. We must let God get the victory in the United States of America. We must let God get the victory. That's in, in our marriages. We must let God get the victory in our personal lives. And if God doesn't, we're sunk. Notice that Syria and Ephraim and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against these, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it. Sin is vexing us. That means oppressing us. Sin is everywhere. Everywhere we look, every, everybody we're around, there's sinners everywhere. Let us make a breach therein. A breach is a destruction or, or, a, or a breaking apart. Is sin breaking apart your marriage? Is it breaking apart our country? Is it breaking up the family? Absolutely. Is it breaking up the church? Absolutely. Let us make a breach therein for us and set a king in the midst of it. That You know who that king is, don't you? It's the Antichrist, typified as the crown of of thorns that was upon Christ's head. Remember, the Bible says that He bore our curse to the cross, that He made a show of His enemies openly upon the cross, nailing the things that were against us to His cross. Thorns were the curse that God gave to the ground after Adam sinned as a result of his sin. God, they want to set a king in the midst of your heart. And that king is the Antichrist. That king is everything that is opposite of Christ. 
Don't let sin have dominion over you. Look at verse 7. Thus saith the Lord God, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. That's because God has already fought the battle against our enemies. This is interesting. The word enemy is found exactly 270 times, which is 30 times 3 times 3, in the King James Version of the Bible. The word enemy or enemies is found exactly 30 times in the New Testament. There are 27 books, 3 times 3 times 3 in the New Testament. And the New Testament is the new covenant or the new promise that God made to deal with and to reconcile for the sins of mankind. There are 27 bones in the human hand. 3 times 3 times 3. Look what Exodus chapter 15 verse 6 says. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. And thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. The enemy is sin. And it all has to do, I'm showing my hand here, it all has to do with the number three. God is an amazing God and this is an amazing book. Now, let's show you this part. The phrase, the beast, and you know who that is, don't you? It's the Antichrist. It's mentioned exactly 33 times in the King James Bible. Freemasonry worships this number. We're going to see aspects of that here in just a little bit. But notice that the Bible calls the beast the man of sin. That's why he's mentioned by this name 33 times in the New Testament of the King James Bible. Now I want to show you this. This is neat. Because um, Joshua chapter 12, verse 1. Now these are the kings of the land which the children of Israel smote and possessed their land on the other side of Jordan uh, toward the rising of the sun from the river Arnon unto Mount Hermon and all the plain on the east. Now I want you to watch this now. Joshua chapter 12, verse 2 says, Sihon, king of the Amorites, and the coast of Og, king of Bashan, which was the remnants of the giants that dwelt at Ashtaroth and Edrei. Now I want you to notice that the Bible is going to show you the number of kings that were killed in the land of Canaan in order for the Israelites to move in. Now remember, the crown of thorns, uh, the, the, uh, the, they set up a king uh, there that we talked about a while ago. The key, these all reference the Antichrist, the beast being mentioned. How many times? 33 times. Because watch this. Moses killed two of these kings, Sion, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, before they crossed over the river Jordan. And then notice Joshua chapter 12, verses 9 through 24. You probably can't read all that on the screen, but I want you to notice there at the bottom, it says, all the kings, 30 and one. Joshua, look at that verse. Joshua chapter 12, verse 24. All the kings, 30 and one. That gives you a total of 33 kings that were destroyed so that Israel could inherit the promised land. You get that, don't you? The typology. The promised land is in heaven. The kings who are against us have to be taken out of the way and killed. And there were 33 of them. And it, it just exactly the number of years that Jesus was when he died on the cross, bearing the crown of thorns. Isn't this Bible amazing? By the way, those kings represent the Antichrist, and that's what's worshipped in the 33rd degree of Freemasonry, that number 33. Look at this image of Baphomet. Now, we do a close-up here. Now, remember, Baphomet, I, I believe, represents Lucifer. And there's lots of things that are encoded into this image. But I want you to notice that Baphomet is extending his arms. And how many fingers does he have extended on each arm? One, two, three. I want you to get this. I want you to picture this because this, you'll, and we're going to see this in other places. You might already be cluing in on where we're going to go here. But the, remember, the number three. Three, unless you specifically see that it's designated as a number of either resurrection or the, or, or the Trinity, the Godhead, the opposite of that then would be, let's say, the Satanic Godhead, which would be Satan the dragon, his son, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, representing the, the antithesis of the Holy Ghost. We see the number for resurrection and life in the number three. We see the number three pointing to sin and death. And so Baphomet is the man of sin, holding up his three 
fingers. We also see that we have a, a video called the Unmasking the Da Vinci Code and in the, the painting that Leonardo da Vinci painted uh, for these nuns uh, showing baby Jesus and baby John the Baptist we see that baby Jesus is bowing in obeisance to John the Baptist who is holding up three fingers. One, two, three. It references sin and the man of sin. You see it often in the Vatican. Popes who give a blessing, they use their three fingers. That does not refer to the Trinity, folks. There is nothing Christian about the Roman Catholic system. It is as pagan as witchcraft is. It is the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth as far as, as, far as that's concerned. And the popes give that three finger blessing. They're pointing you to the, to the future man of sin, the son of perdition. The triketra is a three-part symbol. Notice the phrase, three powers in one. Uh, there is a TV show called Charmed uh, where they use the symbol of the triketra. These three witches, and rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, uh, the power of three will set you free. Think about that. They're trying to tell you that the sin of mankind or the man of sin is what's going to set mankind free. In Freemasonry, three Freemasons get together and they do this little dance uh, and they, they say the secret name of God, Jah Bull on three. The power of three. Freemasons use a triangle. They use a triketra. They are about sin. These all point to, in my opinion, and we, we have videos on this uh, that talk about this, uh, my, a video on DNA. We have, video, we have other videos that talk about this, the secret of Freemasonry and so on. And I believe that it represents the addition of a third strand to the human genome. Take a look at this uh, from Scientific American. Triple helix designing a new molecule of life. I believe that the three fingers, the triketra, and all these symbols refer to a third strand being added to the human DNA. Notice this book from a New Ager called uh, The Path of Empowerment uses this, this uh, triketra or triscala as it's referred to, this three-pointed object to refer to a path of empowerment. That's the New Age movement. That is even moving into the church because uh, we have things like the triple helix, the science, uh, the triple helix. Have we stopped evolving? A, a church called Infusion Church talks about a three-strand spiritual DNA. The symbol for the Priory of Zion, which some say never existed. I believe that it existed in some form uh, that, you know, relates to the Da Vinci Code uses the fleur de lis as their symbol. You know what that is? That's the power of three banded together in one. Notice that there are three things that are banded together in one. That is a picture, I believe, of three-strand DNA. What about this symbol? You've seen this one before. The peace symbol. Notice that one, two, three. You have three prongs here banded together in one. It's an occult symbol, folks, and I've seen I've seen it in churches. I've seen it. I've seen churches use this symbol to market themselves and to market this concept of peace. But it all comes from hell. Granger Community Church. I've talked about these guys several times. They are like on the forefront of leading the emerging church movement and leading the church literally into the hands of the Antichrist. Notice their symbol. It's a triscula. It's a form of a triangle or the triketra. And here it is. The New King James Version of the Bible stamped that image on there. The New King James is not the King James Bible. It's not. Don't read it. I mean, if you read it, if you want to, and find out that I'm telling you the truth. But the New King James Bible represented the transformation of the church from the old paradigm to a new paradigm. This symbol was used on Marilyn Ferguson's book called The Aquarian Conspiracy. Marilyn Ferguson was a staunch New Ager and she wrote this huge book, and I've read most of it, concerning what the plans are of the New Age movement. And she used the symbol of the Triketra or the symbol of the man of sin or the symbol of three-strand DNA on her book, The Aquarian Conspiracy, to show you where it was all headed. You've heard of the Illuminati. They use this symbol of the all-seeing eye inside of the triangle. Now remember what, remember what the devil promised. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. She saw the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life in that fruit, and the devil promised her that her eyes would be open. You know what he was referring to? He was referring to the third eye. 
And that's what that symbol represents. It's on the back of our dollar bill. There was a book written uh, back about 50 years ago called The Mark, and it was about the evolutionary stages of mankind and how that man was about ready to move into his next level of evolution. And notice they used the triangle as their symbol. This exact same symbol used in an emerging church called South Hills Church. And notice the phrase, elevate your life. It's about the evolution of mankind adding a third strand of DNA to the already the two strands. And remember, this is a violation of God's Word. God's Word, DNA is the book that God wrote. I don't have time to get into all that in this video, but DNA is the book that God wrote. And God said, you shall not add to the words of this book. And that is exactly what they have planned. Just remember, we can. I believe that we can find out anything that we want to know, anything that they're keeping secret, we can find out if we'll just study and believe the words of God. I believe the Bible. I believe it was inspired. I believe it is right now the inspired, inerrant Word of God. And the key to your understanding, all these things that I've laid out to you, is to, number one, just simply believe that everything that you see in these pages is already true. It doesn't, God doesn't need you to retranslate this. In fact, he said not to. God, you have everything available to you. All these things that I'm showing you, all these things that I've learned, I didn't learn them at Bible college. I didn't learn them from a commentary. I learned them from studying and believing the Word of God. Now that you have an understanding of the number three, and believe it or not, believe it or not, I know this has taken a while to get all this information out on just this one number, the number three. I've just scratched the surface on this. Go to the Bible. Look at things of three or 30 or 33 or 300 or 3,000 and, and take these principles back as you study. See, that's why I'm doing these videos is that so you can have study aids to study the Word of God. This, what I'm giving you is not the meat that'll sustain your soul. It's the fork and knife for you to cut up the meat and, and understand how it works. You don't eat the fork and knife. You eat the meat, the bread of the Word of God. Study the Word of God and know that God inspired every single word. The Lord bless you. I've, had a, I've enjoyed this study of the Word of God. The next one is going to be on the number four. God bless you for watching these, and Lord bless you. This is Pastor Mike saying bye-bye.